Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout-Taylor. Our guest today is Jeff Schaefer. He is COO and VP of Unifund, and he's the founder of dataplusscience.com. Jeff is also an adjunct professor at the University of Cincinnati, a Tableau Zen master, and co-author of a giant book on data visualization called The Big Book of Dashboards, Visualizing Your Data Using Real-World Business Scenarios. Jeff, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. I've had the pleasure of getting to co-present with you. We actually developed a workshop together on data storytelling, and so I'm excited to share some of the insights we uncovered uh, through our process of creating that workshop together today. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I'm excited to talk about that. But tell us first a little bit about what data storytelling is and how dashboards play an important role in that. Yeah, you know, data storytelling is is kind of a, a broad term and people, it's kind of become a buzzword in the data visualization community, uh, probably in part because of an author, Cole Naflick, Cole Nussbaumer Naflick has a great book called Storytelling with Data. And uh, that that probably set off the term. Her her website is even storytellingwithdata.com. Uh, so I, I think that's that's probably in the last uh, five years, you know, sort of a, a developing thing that that sort of happened with a lot of people talking about how stories play uh, a part in in data itself. Uh, that's been a controversial term, I guess, a, a little bit as well, because you know, stories. If you think about you know a technical definition of a story, you know, it, might, it has characters or it has a plot or it has a storyline, and 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 oftentimes data or a dashboard specifically uh, does does not do that. But then other people use the term more in a broader sense, uh, and and so it's it's kind of you know maybe opening a can of worms, if you will, but um, I can at least, you know, give you, a, give you my take on it, I guess. Um, from a broader standpoint, I'd say dashboards specifically help us find where the stories might be in the data, not necessarily have to tell the story itself. You might be monitoring conditions of something. You might be looking at a process or something in your organization and you might use that dashboard on a daily basis, and that might give you an indication that something's gone wrong. Where to go look? You know, you see smoke, but is it is it a fire? And uh, so that that's uh, that's where I kind of see you know data storytelling comes into play in a number of areas. But as it relates to dashboards, dashboards may be one of the tools to help you find the stories that you bring out in your data. Definitely. And most organizations are using dashboards to analyze and visualize, uh, you know, data points that are massive and trying to really be able to see that data in a way that helps them take some sort of action or, like you mentioned, know when to prevent a fire or or check in on a problem. And one of the one of the really interesting things about our work together is, is I think, our way of combining the concept uh, that that data in itself, you know, I think there's this assumption, right, that data is pure or that that numbers never tell stories. Um, but as as you advance in your understanding of data and what to do with data and what actions we take as a result of data, it's clear that storytelling is integral to data visualization. It's really part part and parcel of coming up with the the ways that we can sort of find logic or find patterns and and take action from data. I, I think that's right. And mm -hmm. I, I would add to that, you know, in in the way we intersected together, you and I on 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 our work with with that particular workshop, I think what we we kind of discovered some of those things, right? In my teaching, I usually talk about data is just really in a raw form, you know, a database, a SQL server, uh, your Excel spreadsheet or a tab delimited file or something. And, and in and of itself, it, it doesn't do anything. It just it just kind of sits, right? And then you you want to get information out of that data. So you you look at it, you aggregate it, you filter it, you you sort of dive into it to find those things about it. 
And ultimately, that information should lead to knowledge that you get out of that data. So, you know, I talk about the continuum of, you know, data to information, information to knowledge. In the knowledge section, you really need the, the what, what I call the SME, the subject matter expert, to really help you find the learnings of what you're getting from that information in in the data and in the workshop. You know, in our particular case, we were working um, with a with a major hospital, and you know, I'm not a healthcare expert by any means. I'm not a doctor. Uh, I I have done some consulting in that field, but I I don't know a lot about that data specifically, right? And so you really have to work together as a group to kind of figure out what that is. I can build a dashboard for somebody that would give them an indication of maybe something gone wrong, but then 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 what, right? What's the next step? And so I think that's uh, that's the intersection for me is where data storytelling and in a variety of forms. In our particular client, you know, that we were talking to, they had one group that might have wanted to hand something out as as sort of a pamphlet. Um, in another instance, it might be something they want to add to their website. And then in another group, they they were really looking for something that uh, internally they could monitor sort of as, as a dashboard. And when we think about data storytelling, that's really different in each one of those categories, right? It's a it might be a different end product. It might be a different uh, might be a different way method of telling the story completely. Yes. And so a critical element of data storytelling and, and the the way that that term, I think, is a little bit different from just data collection or data reporting is that you're thinking really critically about the audiences that are receiving that information and how they make knowledge from it. And so quite a bit of what we do together in our data storytelling workshop is, Jeff, you do a brilliant job of covering the best practices in data visualization the different types of data visuals that you can make. And then we then we build on that information and we talk more about persona and audience and how to map data points and data needs to the different audiences you're trying to reach with that information. And we talk about what best practices exist for being able to build context for the data. So that means the words that surround your data visualizations or your data. And it also means the way that you present it or what data points you choose to share. And really trying to map, we, we do this exercise or we create this giant uh, sort of giant whiteboard exercise chart where we're mapping the different personas and audiences that that organization is trying to reach with their data to the different data points. We prioritize those data points. We think through what visual metaphors will be helpful, especially pulling on those best practices and data visualization. And then we think about the target medium. And sometimes that's a dashboard, like you mentioned, and sometimes that's an infographic or a handout. So it's it's really this beautiful way of being sure that when we're thinking about data, we're not ignoring the fact that we are humans who need to act as a result of seeing data. I, I think that's great. And that was another just fascinating intersection between, you know, your work and, and the work I've done, you know, both as a professor or consulting in workshops. I always tell my students, you know, when you're starting a data visualization in general, the first questions you need to ask are, who's your audience and what's the message? And your points right there, you know, who's the audience? I thought lately, you know, I've, I've, there's a third element that kind of relates to the audience is how are they going to consume it? Um, so you have, you know, who's your audience? What's the message? And maybe how are they going to consume yeah, what's that, the medium? that message? Yeah. Um, but that I think that hits right on your points. And that's why I loved your, your persona mapping so well, because it really gets down to when you talk about who's the audience, are we, I use our healthcare example, are we talking about doctors? Are we talking about staff? Are we talking about patients? Are we talking about uh, outside people or internal people? And all of those things kind of played. And, you know, some of those are really interesting when, when you're talking about uh, what's the message that you're trying to get out. You, you know, somebody from a, and, and, you know, in our current environment with the, with the, the COVID uh, outbreak here, um, it's kind of interesting we're talking about healthcare, but, you know, from a doctor standpoint, they might want to look at things on a on a aggregate basis and look at statistics, but at the end of the day, we're talking about people, right? We're talking about patients and being able to see that. And a patient certainly wants to know a different piece of information. Is you know, what about me? You're like me in this group of other people. 
Uh, so I think just nailing down that that audience, the persona, who who are those people? What information do they need? When do they need it? How are they going to get it? That really drives everything else. So whether it are, are we talking about an interactive visualization that's going to live on a website, or are we talking about an infographic that you're going to hand out in a pamphlet, or is this a, a PDF that needs to be emailed out to the staff, uh, you know, every day or every week? And so those are very very important questions. Let's share some of our favorite data stories or data visualizations. Uh, you go first because I feel like you are a, a library of knowledge when it comes to really effective and interesting ways to bring data to life. Oh wow, I got so many favorites uh, out there. It's it's even it's even hard to pick, and and so many different genres. I'll say in the data visualization world. Some of the designers that I love, uh, you know, from a, a data viz a, a infographic and, and data viz design standpoint, uh, would be uh, Georgia Lupi. Um, she she ran a, a firm called Accurate for a long time. She's moved on to a, a graphic design uh, company, uh, but I love I love her work and what she's done. Uh, there's another graphic designer that uh, came from the graphic design world, Nicholas Felton, and and he created ten years of uh, the Feltron report. And uh, these go back a few years now. He he stopped doing those uh, a number of years ago, but I, I just I love their work, and I still uh, use that as inspiration in in the work uh, that that I do. Um, I, I follow a lot of people in the Tableau community, you know, being one of the, the Tableau Zen masters and 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 Tableau being my tool of choice. Uh, I, I follow a lot of people in the Tableau community. So there's countless people in the Tableau community, many of them, you know, good friends of mine. Uh, so I, I look to that for examples as as well. And, uh, you know, having written the, the big book of dashboards, I, I'm always, uh, I always gravitate to great examples uh, that people have. Out, out there, real world uh, dashboards. Um, a good friend of mine, Chris Love, has a website called Everyday Dashboards, and uh, I find that one fascinating because it's it's people who have taken dashboards that they use at work every day and has either anonymized it or turned it into a way that they could share it. Uh, but you get to see, you know, not not work necessarily that's polished by the New York Times for the front page of the newspaper. It's, it's everyday stuff that people use to get the job done. And so I, uh, I often gravitate to those kind of things as well. Can you share with us some of the current projects that you're working on or that you've worked on recently? The most interesting project that, that I've worked on uh, this year was with an organization called Splash. Uh, they're out of San Francisco. It's a nonprofit that helps bring water uh, clean water to uh, to the various countries of the world, specifically right now, working on large projects in uh, Calcutta and in India and uh, Ethiopia. And uh, so through the Tableau Foundation, um, myself and one of the other Tableau Zen masters, Christy Martini, he and I built uh, a, a phase one for them uh, that went live a couple weeks ago. We built out a dashboard uh, with some maps on it and uh, and it was interactive. They they had a uh, they wanted a satellite feature to be able to see uh, the maps in a in a satellite way. Uh, then they had some other um, key outputs that they wanted to track, and so we built a, an output dashboard. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, I I have heard that uh, they they were traveling before the before the outbreak of uh, the coronavirus, but they were traveling a lot out for uh, funders and donors and uh, the, the project managers in the various countries. And uh, it was exciting to hear uh, how, that, how that dashboard project developed. Uh, so that was exciting. That's probably my, my most recent project uh, that, that, that I have had going on. Perfect. So I, I'll share a link. If you can share it publicly, I'll put it in the show notes. Absolutely. Another couple of examples, and I have to give you credit, Jeff, for sharing these with me, but um, Alberto Lucas Lopez worked with National Geographic and they were reporting on malnutrition in children. And uh, I'll also link this in the show notes so you can get the visual. This is hard to, it's hard to talk about data storytelling in a podcast <laughs> format. But um, essentially inside of this article in National Geographic, you have to physically cut out a ruler that's sort of built into the page and then you can loop that ruler to create a circle and you see actual mid upper arm circumference measurements from children in malnourished communities 
And so you, it's this really powerful example of trying to help elicit empathy and, and really be able to tactically feel how small um, their upper arm circumferences are in, in areas where children face malnutrition. That's a really powerful one. You shared that with me, Jeff. Yeah, that was, uh, I think that was last year um, and, a, and, a, and just a great example of making it personal. That's another thing in, in, in some of my teaching and, and workshops I've done is, is, you know, if you want to get engagement on, on your visualizations, you know, making it personal. And, and so you think about one of, one of my favorite examples is my co-author, Steve Wexler. He, he has a, a visualization on the uh, age of people in, uh, in the United States. And if you just showed a visualization of uh, sort of the distribution of age in the United States, you, you might look at it and say, okay, you know, so what? Maybe there's this interesting thing that you might see in the data. But what he does instead, uh, using uh, some other techniques that, that others in you know, news organizations are great at doing this, but you make it personal and say, enter your age. And when you put your age in there, you know, this visualization recalculates to show you how much of the population is older than you based on being a male who is 40 or 50, uh, or if you're a female and, and how many are younger. And so you kind of get a sense for where you are. And so I think um, that that particular visit you're talking about really makes it personal because it takes something that you you don't really see. You don't really have a way of grasping it visually or mentally, you know, how bad is it? And yet you tear this thing off and put it on your wrist and it's, and then all of a sudden it's, wow, you know, it just kind of hits you. And so I think that's, you know, sort of the ultimate um, in, in sort of making it personal, hitting the message home, right? Yeah, absolutely. And one, one research study that you and I, I think are both fascinated by, it was conducted by NYU School of Engineering and law. And together they tried to understand whether making the data visual itself look and feel more relatable or more personalized or individualized, whether that would have an impact on the empathy of the viewer. And so, for instance, instead of having just a dot in the data visual to represent a person, they might have uh, an icon of a human, like a visual that looked more like a person. Um, Or even more specific, they might put a name to that person. And they tried all of these different sort of experiments with that to show more generic or more personalized and whether that would have an impact on the viewer's level of empathy as they looked at that data. And the really interesting finding from that study was that making the data visual itself didn't seem to have an impact on empathy, but the story or the the text surrounding the data visual did. So if the text went into more detail about the personal stories of the people who were being represented in the data visual next to it, that elicited more empathy. And they admit that this was a small study design and that it probably needs to be done on a broader context. But what are your thoughts on that finding? You know, that was fascinating to me. And and this, that might be something to link to as, as well yeah, in, your, I'll link to in that. your show notes. Um, I, I, I'm not at, I'm not surprised by that, you know, thinking about how effective is, uh, you know, you see in infographics, you see little, little people often representing a bar chart or, you know, isotypes in some form. Um, and I, and I, and I've always wondered that, you know, is a, is a dot just as, as good. And, and I think that study kind of leads that, that that might be correct. Um, so I, I think that's fascinating. There's, there's lots of other studies uh, you know, things about where you put things on a page, you know, and so your headline, whether you're creating a dashboard or a visualization or just a PowerPoint slide, your top left corner of your of your viz is where everybody is going to look, you know, at first, right? And so what you're talking about, that text having a, thinking about what the title is, having a descriptive subtitle, having good annotation layers and having them in the right place organized on the page can make all the difference in the world to something like that. Uh, in our dashboard workshops, we talk about, you know, your, your, your key performance indicators uh, or bands, as, as we often call them, you know, these big numbers, you put them across the top of your visualization because that's where people are going to look. And it's sort of the headline, right? It's the headline of the, of the story. And then you kind of get down into the details under, underneath it. 
Um, now, one thing I will say is, you know, they didn't, this study didn't compare this, but I think there's something to be said for when we're aggregating data versus disaggregating that data. I think that if we ran that study and said, okay, here's bar charts showing the average uh, lifespan of somebody who has uh, the coronavirus, you know, the or the uh, the death rate or something, that's going to be a lot less personal than if I had dots, you know, for every one of those people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's maybe something to be said is maybe being careful about, you know, aggregating up, losing that personal, you know, touch of it that, you know, there may be something to showing a hundred dots on a page for my hundred patients. And this is you, and this is where everybody else is versus just showing, oh, here's the average of where the hundred patients are. And here's where you are. Uh, so I, I think it you know, kind of goes both ways, but I think there's some interesting things are, about that study, and hopefully there'll be future studies in that area. We, we dove really deep you know, into some of the more complex challenges surrounding data storytelling, everything from eliciting empathy to having an ethical stance around you know, thinking ethically about how you're visualizing data. Let's actually step back backwards a little bit and talk about some of the basics, because what I love about working with you, uh, you know, on this workshop and, and in other projects is that you have you have really refined and sort of created patterns that you see of the different types of data visualizations and the impact that they have on the viewer. One of the things that I think maybe some listeners will be surprised about that I was surprised to learn is that we should try to always avoid the pie chart. Yeah, you know that that particular chart type, pie charts and donut charts, get a lot of bad press in the in the data visualization community, and uh, and and people often associate it with just charts. You know, I, many of my colleagues in the field, you know, will just say, just don't use them, and and you know that that advice uh, is is probably good advice. Um, I think it's it's a little more nuanced than that. Sure, always, sure. So no matter whether <laughs> you know you, whatever the data viz uh, chart is. Um, it kind of goes back to the fundamental building blocks in in data viz. We call them the, the pre-attentive attributes. And just human beings are, are really good at some things and just not good at other things. And so really what you're, I think the, the question leads to is really what are humans good at and can we leverage the things that humans are good at to get to the information quickly and accurately? And in most of the data viz research that's that's out there, the foundational research really measures those two things. That's what that's what all the research has really been based on. Um, more recently, we've studied other things like you know memor you know memory of of a viz or things like that. But you know, really at the heart of it, are are we getting the information quickly and accurately? And so, as an example, or the example you used. Uh, we are generally better, um, we are better as humans, and, and this has been studied with looking at things like position. Um, we're very, very good at, at the position of objects in space. We're very, very good at looking at uh, the length or width of something, but we really fail you know, miserably when it comes to estimating the size of something or um, uh, the angle of something or the arc of something or um, even color, you know, the, trying to figure out how much more blue is that, you know, is it twice as much blue or is it three times as much blue? That's going to be a very, very difficult task, you know, to do. And so it's really learning, I guess, the basics of data visualization more than just the chart types, but just sort of the, the fundamental, you know, way our brain uh, interprets this information and, and does it quickly. Uh, and then leveraging those things to get the the right things on a page. You know, I, I think one of the things that you probably picked up on from from a lot of those slides is you know simplicity. Really, I mean, even if I take a you know the evil pie chart, I can make a pie chart you know usable by just reducing its complexity. So instead of having eighteen slices, maybe I only have two, or you know just show one number, eighty five percent or something like that. And so really, no matter what chart type you pick, if I say bar charts or stack bar charts or line charts, if I add 50 colors to it and uh, and and add a thousand labels, it's going to become incomprehensible and we're going to overload the reader and they're not going to get the message no matter what chart type I use, right? So it's it's kind of a combination of these things um, that, that you kind of learn and put together. Now, tell us the process of taking data visualizations and moving them into dashboards where we're looking at multiple data sets or data points. 
Can you tell us some best practices that we should have in mind as we migrate um, and and work to build a larger story with the data? Yeah, boy, that's um, that's 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 a great one because that's uh, I think that's what many organizations are challenged with every day. So uh, you know, I'm going to start at the beginning, which is your data. Uh, where, how good is your data? So you know, you're going to have to sit down and and figure that out. So you need to figure out what is it, what are the key things that you're trying to measure in your organization? What are those, what are those key performance indicators? Do we know them? And what do we want to track? And then once you, once you have that, you got to start with the data because you may not even have the data to track the things that you need to track, right? And so it starts with the data, having um, you know, some semblance of uh, data governance, data gathering, knowing where it is, what's the source of it, how good is it, can we trust it, right? There's the sort of the veracity of, of the data, if you will. And then, you know, once you have that, then you can kind of put those things together. You know, I, I find many organizations, um, well, I'll use the healthcare example, again, that you and I uh, collaborated on, they had data coming in from, you know, a dozen different sources. And so, uh, you know, that, that adds to the complexity of it. Yes, Where does it yes. come from? How good is it? Can we trust it? How often is it updated? Uh, there's, there's, there's data is always messy, you know, especially if there's free form responses in the data and things like that. So that, that's really the starting point for me. We have to figure out what, what we're trying to measure, what we're trying to improve, what we're trying to monitor. And then, you know, we go to the data and see if we can put that together. Then the next step is, you know, sort of the design of that thinking about, okay, well, we want to measure what do we want to measure uh, our actuals versus a target? Do we want to see something over time? Do we want to see the location of people? And that's going to drive what visualizations we choose, whether we're using a bar chart with a target line or whether we're plotting people on a map. Um, that's going to be the tool that we use to answer the questions that we asked in, in the first part. And then putting it all together on the dashboard, um, you know, as uh, as nuanced and you know we wrote a book about it the, the you know that part is almost the easy part after you if you've done the first two parts correctly um getting it together in the final step is um is, is almost the easy part right you know putting it together in a way in a simplistic uh, sort of uh, simple as ne- uh, simple as can be with as, as much detail as necessary uh in a way that people can can see it and use it what should we be anticipating when it comes to the future of data storytelling. I'm thinking specifically about artificial intelligence, big data, and the you know increasing ability for technology to interpret and analyze data to some degree. I, I think it's great and I think it's horrifying, you know, both in, in one. Um, you know, the great part is the tools are getting so much better. They're getting the 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 way, and I, I'll speak to what I know best would be Tableau. You know, they're doing quarterly releases and the features that they're adding at such fast pace. It's just amazing that they're 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 just uh, you know, quarter after quarter, they're just adding these these features in there. One of their one of the ones that they focused on last year was what they call ask data where you have an artificial intelligent engine that sort of figures out behind the scenes what query you're asking when you say, how much were sales last month? And then you say, and how about Ohio? You know, it doesn't start your query over. It says, oh, you want to know how, how many sales, you know, in the US. And then when you asked an Ohio, it sub queries that and, and goes down to Ohio. I think that's wow. that's brilliant. You know, it's a great tool. Where I think it's horrifying is... We have to be really, really careful. Again, it goes back to our data. Do you understand the data that you brought in? You know, did you already aggregate the data before it was brought in, or maybe it was not aggregated? So when you start asking questions, you better be really careful about what that data was that you brought in, to because you, you you know you're going to ask a question, it's going to give you an answer, and you're going to if you treat that as gospel, uh, you could get yourself into a lot of trouble. Um, so I can just think of you know instances where. You know, you'll bring in data of you know ten years over time of uh, of say healthcare data, you know, child mortality data or something, and uh, you ask a question. Well, did it sum that up for you, or did it average it for you, and did it average it how and over what period of time? And and those are all things that um, at least today and in the near future we need to be in control of, right? We need to understand how it's doing that and not just. Uh, letting the uh, AI take over the answer for us and, and trusting it. Yes, it's incredible that 
it, it's an incredible responsibility that we're putting into our technologies and to the degree that we can keep making sure that from an ethical perspective, those algorithms are accurate and that we are still bringing humans in to ensure their accuracy and ensure that the interpretations are correct. I, I don't know that we'll ever get to a point where humans are not playing a role in uh, in that process. At least I, I hope perhaps that we don't get to that point. Yeah, I'm part of it may be just, I, I think, where we are on the curve, right? Everybody's talking about artificial intelligence, machine learning specifically, and and people are realizing that, you know, to do that, we have to be, um, you know, we have to be doing that to stay ahead. And, and that's all great. It's just, uh, I guess, putting the critical thinking to our data is, uh, is not something that we can give up at this point. And so I think as you talked about, you know, in the, in the data storytelling, I just wouldn't want to rely on, you know, a computer in the near future giving me that story. I want to, I want to apply the the human element of, of cognition, you know, to be able to uh, interpret those results and then ultimately come up with that story. And maybe that'll change 20 years from now. But I think where we are today, um, you know, that's one of the fears fears I have. You know, getting back to that idea of empathy, I, I think that's part of the reason why that fear is so real. Um, one of the studies in the technical writing world that I come from, um, a professional writing researcher went into the military and observed their practices around analyzing data when it comes to making decisions about um, aerial, you know, attacks. And sometimes that data was more personalized and sometimes that data was less personalized, meaning there were certain code words or ways that they would sort of use rhetoric rhetorical choices to remove the individuality of those communities uh, from that data. And the finding was that when that individuality was further removed from the data and, and the language that they were speaking around those aerial attack decisions, those attacks were more frequent. They were done with less critical thinking, as you said. Um, and I'll link to that research as well, because I think it's a powerful example of remembering why um, why we should always be mindful of the stories we're telling ourselves from the data. And if if the language choices that we're making as we analyze that data are working to distance ourselves from the the impacts of, of that information, I think we should we need to be especially mindful of how that perhaps enables certain actions and uh, or speeds up certain actions or, or, or removes empathy from those moments. I, I, we are living a moment right now where that is absolutely true with the way the coronavirus is spreading around the world and data coming from various places. John Hopkins has a centralized uh, database that uh, a group of people at Tableau uh, tapped into and, and made available to everybody the amount, uh, I think, uh, yesterday. Uh, or I think it was yesterday, there's a, there's a, a thread on um, a Reddit subthread uh, called uh, Information is Beautiful. And it was the first day that um, the majority of visualizations on that thread were, were based on the coronavirus. So 52% or something of the visualizations that were being posted out there uh, had to do with that. And uh, that's something I think, you know, you hit right on there is we, we just have to be really careful about that. You know, I could show numbers of, say, you know, the coronavirus and say, oh, well, the death rate is only and, you know, put in your percent, 2 percent, 1 percent, less than a percent, whatever. Uh, but it, it's much more detailed, right? If you dive in and, and, and kind of filter that down and see, oh, if you're over a certain age, you know, the death rate is 15 percent. And, and so it's easy to, you know, throw this off and, and, and throw out data and just say, OK, well, it's not so bad. It's, it's just like the flu or uh, or it's not spreading as quick. And, and you're you're inferring data or you're aggregating data in a way where you lose that empathy that you're talking about. You, you think about, OK, well, if I'm 75 or 80 years old, um, I, I may not feel that way. And so, you know, for somebody my age to say, oh, I'm not really worried about it because it's, you know, 0.5% chance of dying, um, that kind of disconnects us from sort of the rest of humanity there, doesn't it? And, and so visualizing that in ways, um, you know, I've seen a lot of discussion in the last uh, week where, where people have just, myself included, 
just have taken the route of, you know what, we're just not going to visualize that data because we, we, we just don't know enough about it at this point to be confident in what we're producing. And, uh, and I think that goes to the opposite of empathy, right? We could actually do harm in some situations. Yeah, it's incredible, especially as more data is publicly available and more tools like Power BI and Tableau are accessible. We have to start questioning then the legitimacy of those visualizations and and making sure that we're analyzing, is this coming from a credible source or not? Because like you mentioned, those, those publicly available data visualizations, now 50% of them are, uh, you know, on coronavirus. And so are there ways, are there strategies that you would recommend to the public um, in terms of understanding or being able to assess whether a visualization is credible? Well, yeah. So, I mean, two things. One, if I'm the visualizer, I have to ask myself, and, and this is what I've done personally, do do I need to visualize it? You know, I, I, I will tell you, I've downloaded the data. I've connected to the data. I connected to the data um, prior to the work that the Tableau group did, and I even connected to their data, and I've made some visualizations, but I, I decided not to publish any of that. I just wanted to know myself and look at the data myself and see what was going on. For the visas that are out there, when I read them, I just have to look at it with a healthy bit of skepticism, right? Is, it, you know, they're visualizing this information. I'm not saying that they're, they're all bad by any means. It's just you have to understand the context in which the data was gathered. For example, to, you know, to compare it to the flu. Well, the flu's been around for a very, very long time, and we have a long, long history of data on that. This, this, this coronavirus is brand new. So to make an A-B comparison there makes it really, really difficult because we don't, we don't know yet, right? Um, to make any kind of comparison to what's going on in China, you know, that's different conditions, different health conditions, different amount of people in a different amount of space and different environments under different government control. We can't take the data that we have there and superimpose it on the United States and say it's going to travel as fast or faster or slower or even the same. Uh, so just things that we just have to kind of be careful of is, is, uh, I, I guess this this applies to any data really, but especially in this data is is using it in a way that we're we're making assumptions of the data, right? Absolutely, that's right. Yeah, and even on uh, NPR on my drive here to the recording studio, they were talking about the ba- this fine balance that that the medical community is trying to get, you know, that the public we really need to strike, which is between knowing where the virus is at any given moment and how rapidly it's spreading. And balancing that with the fact that going in to get tested puts more of the public at risk. And so trying to kind of, I think at this point, the advice is sort of if you're having symptoms, try to isolate yourself. And if you if if those symptoms accelerate or get much worse, then go see a medical provider. So maybe don't jump to even getting tested right away because um, that's going to put other people at, at risk, right, of, of exposure. So it's such an it's such a strange time that we're living in right now, and um, and I'm really I'm grateful that we've been able to think of, together about how data storytelling and and data visualization is part of that conversation. Yeah, especially with with the empathy part that that you often talk about. I think that's it's just right on. Jeff, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I love working with you. I love that you have this incredible site. If you, I recommend everyone go check out dataplusscience.com. It is an incredible resource where Jeff breaks down different visualization strategies and he, and, and together we're, we're thinking more about storytelling. We hope to have more content out there together in the future on that topic. But uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, Jeff, if people want to find you on social media, what where can they find you? Uh, very active on uh, Twitter. Um, my uh, Twitter handle is uh, high viz v i z ability, and um, also on uh, I, I'm I'm around, easy to find. Uh, <laughs> connect up on LinkedIn or uh, or Facebook. I have a Data Plus Science page. Um, connect up on dataplusscience.com. So yeah, I'm I'm kind of all over the social media. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jeff. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. 